Hey, hi everyone. My name is Steph, and my co-presenter, Martin Pitt, and I are going to be talking about error budgets today, specifically how to apply them to your open source project. I wish we could be there in Brno all together. I have such good memories, and I'm imagining a room full of all the cool people. Um, and us celebrating together but alas we can't this is virtual and uh but i'm yearning for those days again oh well so error budgets error budgets are usually applied to services and operations they're something that measure the reliability stability or latency or other expectations of a service However, it's a really useful technique, and I want to share how to how to apply them to an open source project. So why would you do such a thing? Why would you use error budgets in an open source project? What problem are we actually trying to solve here? Have you ever felt that the maintenance of your open source project was becoming overwhelming? Like there's too many bugs piling up? in your project or too many issues being filed or CI was way too flaky to be useful. Maybe your infrastructure that you rely on for packaging or, or for testing is constantly falling over. Too much code review going on. These are all actually signs that your project is successful. Most projects don't have this kind of problem. It's a good problem where you have a lot of action going on, but it can be overwhelming. So how do you know what to focus on? How do you make sense of this? And that this is where we use this handy methodology, error budgets, to get out of this overwhelmed state and know whether what you're feeling is normal and it's okay, it's not a problem yet, uh, we can survive, or if it's out of control and you need to pay attention and focus on it. What error budgets come from this uh, concept called uh, site reliability engineering. It's a, it's a methodology that was pioneered at Google and error budgets are a foundational framework in there. You can read all about it in the, in the SRE holy book uh, from O'Reilly here. Um, I actually have it on a shelf behind me. But you don't need it in, in, in dead tree form. You can read it online. Let's click this link here. You can see the entire book here online. And it's a long read. But the main one, the main chapter that's interesting for error budgets is this one called service level objectives. And um, I'm not going to read you the whole thing like a bedtime story, but we'll go through some basic concepts and give you a quick briefing. And then uh, Pity is going to show us how uh, they applied it in the cockpit project. Error budgets are a budget of how often a given event, usually an error, is allowed to happen in a given time frame usually 28 or 30 days. And if that amount of that event, that error or that state is exceeded, then you stop other work and you focus on fixing the root cause of whatever caused that problem. Um, this all starts, if, you, if you're trying to work with error budgets, this all starts with a level of service. You have to ask people, ask your users, ask your contributors, ask the people who are experiencing your project what their expectations really are. So here's some examples of levels of service for a project. The project is not stable for users if bugs are constantly being filed as issues and they're piling up in a big backlog. Users expect a stable project and this is how we can tell if the project is not stable enough. Um, secondly, a different experience is users should rarely see test flakes that is to say, false positives um, in the CI testing on their pull request. Or another example, a contributor should, sip, uh, should typically see their pull request reviewed in a day or two. Now, these are experiences from a user's perspective or a contributor's perspective, and they're not really something you can act against or measurable. They're very hazy. So the next step is to take these and make them concrete. The concrete form of a level of service is called a service level indicator. These are measurable things. How would you measure these three different uh, experiences? 
Well, the first one, we could measure it by using the, the GitHub or GitLab API and figuring out how many open non-RFE, that is to say, not feature enhancement request issues have been filed and are still open, sitting there. These are bugs. Um, for the second one, we could measure what are the percentage of all the pull requests that got merged without a test retry, without someone manually retrying the tests or asking the CI to retrigger it. And for the third one, we could, we could measure the age of the open pull requests that have no review. Okay, so we have ways of measuring these things. Now we need to figure out what is the acceptable range. Um, and those are called the service level objective or SLO. These are the targets that you think make sense and that the user who has the expectation for that experience would agree with. So for the first one, again, oops, we might uh, say that more than two and less than 100 open bugs in the last 30 days is acceptable, but anything more or, out or less than that is not acceptable. This one's actually interesting. There's a little twist in here because obviously if you have, you know, these numbers are arbitrary for this project, our fictitious project here. But if you have a lot of bugs being opened really quickly, there's an indicator that something has gone wrong. We need to figure out what it is. But also if no bugs are being filed, that's, that's suspicious too. And that's worth looking into. Like, is the bug tracker not working? Is anyone using the latest release? Did someone fork your code and all the users went and using the fork? Like, that's worth figuring out what the hell is going on. So here you can see this SLO has an upper and a lower bound. Um, and in that range makes sense. Outside of it, doesn't. Um, for the second one, the percentage of pull requests merged without a test retry, we might say 95% is acceptable. Every once in a while, the reality is you're going to have to retry the test for some reason or another. Maybe dependency has a problem or something. So we set a reasonable uh, objective here. And this is important. When you're defining error budgets, 100% is almost never a correct value for an SLO. Why? Because a typical contributor can't tell the difference between nearly perfect and perfect. And if you aim for absolutely perfect on your SLOs, you're going to waste way too much time and energy on exactly this. And they won't have the intended effect. They're, they're essentially being, they're, they're noisy, they're nagging, instead of actually being genuine and representing reality. And lastly, we can see the SLO for this one. Um, we expect that uh, the, the open pull requests have some form of view in less than two days. And that is our, that's our SLO. We can measure that. We can measure um, the age of an open pull request that has no review. And we can say that um, under two days is acceptable, over two days is not. So let's look how this actually plays out. Imagine we measured these over time. And what is an error budget? An error budget is that measured SLO over a rolling window. So I think I, I dropped the third example here. But for the first example, we can see here we have a graph of over 30 days of the number of issues opened each day. And well, our SLO said less than two over in 30 days and more than 100 in 30 days was uh, outside of our error budget. We've used up our error budget here because over the last 30 days, we had 254 issues filed. So very likely sometime in the middle of the month here, we already used up our error budget and we should have taken action. So this, is, this is an example of where the error budget has been exceeded. And in this case, exceeded dramatically. And in the second case here, this is number of tests uh, that were merged without retries. We can see that uh, on average, over the last 30 days, 95.1% um, have been merged without retries. So we've used up most of our air budget, right? Because our goal was 95, but we're still okay. And in fact, if as long as we keep this trend going, where most tests are stable, as you can see, they're above 95% uh, stable, then we're going to be fine. But we should be ready, in this case, to take action. But we don't have to take any action yet. So I hope that makes sense. That's a whirlwind uh, tour of how to get to an error budget. 
But then the question is, what do you do in this first case when the error budget has been exceeded? Like, okay, that's interesting. Now what? Let's talk about that. When you're getting close to exceeding your error budget or it has been exceeded, you should stop all other work and focus on that error budget. So you stop working on new functionality, your, your branches, your pull requests, merging new features, um, accepting contributions uh, that are new features, and you triage what is the root cause of that error budget being exceeded. You ask the question, you try to find out what is going on here? How can we change this so that it doesn't happen again? For example, in the case, in this case, we had way too many issues um, being filed. And that's an indicator that the project is not stable enough for users. So we might ask, is, is there one broken thing that we merged recently that broke everything? And it's the root cause of all these bugs being filed. We should do some work to figure that out. Or do we have enough unit and integration tests to catch regressions? Maybe every time we merge code, we break something, uh, something, a little something here or there, and we really need to invest more time in our project and, and check before merging a pull request, whether it's tested, whether there's a CI test or a unit test that covers it. Or maybe it's just all gone to pot as a one-time event, and we, we need to spend some time fixing all the issues. And uh, we need to set aside two weeks to, to stabilize the thing. Who knows? That's possible. Um, what if too few bugs are being filed? Well, is the bug tracker being broken? Is nobody using our project? We talked about this before, but it's also worth investigating and figuring out what the root cause of it is. Um, then, based on the root cause, figure out what you're going to do to change the error budget. Make a decision. If you're the only person in the project or the maintainer, make the decision yourself or work with uh, the other co-maintainers, the team, have a little discussion. Figure out, okay, here's what we figured out um, and, and talk about what to do. So you might fix the root cause, you might spend time fixing bugs, add tests and so on. Um, but until that action is completed, you don't merge pull requests that are unrelated to this action. You only merge the ones that are related to this action. Um, you, you, Excuse me. You push out your goals and milestones. Maybe you wanted to land a big feature and so on. Well, you delay it realistically. You, you don't have a project that, uh, that is healthy by this indication, by the error budgets indication. So you should delay that. And um, you have to also make sure that the the requests that you that uh, that pull requests that are coming in from others abide by that same thing. So you have to communicate with others that we're in this state. If you do have a time-based release, like maybe you release every two weeks or every month or every six months, you still do your release. And it will include simply less features or less work that's unrelated to um, this root cause, more fixes, more stability, and so on. So what are the benefits of using error budgets in this way? Well, you remove stress from the teams and maintainers working on the project because you don't have to second guess yourself. Is the project stable enough? Yes or no. Um, do I need to spend time on code review or triaging issues or fixing the CI system? Yes or no. You don't have to double over on this. You can actually focus and that, re that reduces stress. Um, it's an indicator of health for your project. Like we said, you can communicate it to your contributors, to your users, where you're at and what you're investing in. And that increases a lot of trust that uh, and people like working in a place that's predictable and they can they can tell what's going on. Or they like using a project that, that communicates this kind of thing to them. And contributors are no longer frustrated. They get the expected experience. Obviously, the, the things like uh, CI works better, um, issues uh, are addressed, and so on. And of course, I use three examples here. You can come up with your own. Um, there's many of these uh, that, uh, that error budgets could be applied to. I keep harping on the same ones just as examples. And the users feel engaged and heard. So consequences. Well, you have to be rigorous in order for this to work. In the uh, in error budgets, as described in the SRE handbook, there's two teams. There's the SRE team, the engineering team, and 
they measure the error budget and the SRE team, which is responsible for operating the service, um, the reliability of the service won't accept changes or new features from the engineering team while the error budgets are exceeded. So there's like a natural cross check there, right? Whereas if you're one team working or one person even working on a, on a project, you have to be rigorous yourself. You have to stick to it. You have to measure it and actually act on it. And so it requires a little bit of diligence. Um, it may delay feature work or new functionality in the project. Yeah, no surprise there. And it forces you to actually take the time to focus on technical debt or overwhelming backlogs. And it also indicates when you should stop focusing on technical debt because it's good enough. There's endless bugs and endless problems and endless backlogs in your project, and you can get lost in there forever. This helps give you a heads up saying, OK, we did it. We're good enough now, and we can focus back on contributions or new functionality that you want to merge or other things like that. Cool. So I'm going to hand this over now to Pity, who has an excellent dive into how this is applied in the cockpit project to do with infrastructure and test flakes. Take it away. Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Pitt. I lead the cockpit team at Red Hat. So first of all, thanks a lot, Steph, for the introduction about error budgets. And I want to explain how we apply these principles to our cockpit project. When I first heard about this concept, error budgets did not really seem to apply to our project. Cockpit is a software product after all. Uh, users install it from the package and use that. We don't provide a service to run Cockpit for them. However, we do use web services internally, namely the machines and an OpenShift cluster to run our tests. And we crucially depend on that infrastructure. And for that, service level objectives and error budgets very much do apply. And it, it's a little easier for us because this is obviously an internal service. So we are our own provider and customer. And we have a tight feedback loop. And so we don't need to play any blame game. In the past, we had long phases of slowly deteriorating tests or unstable infrastructure. So we got used to hitting the retry button a lot until stuff parks. And of course, this is frustrating. It makes it really hard to land stuff, and we got afraid to touch code with known unstable tests. And more importantly, it also hides real-world problems. While many bugs are on the tests themselves, in a lot of cases, these failures actually show bugs in our product, Cockpit, or its dependencies, the operating system that it runs on. And so we also did not have any systematic prevention of introducing new unstable tests. So occasionally we did a clean up some mess sprint, but it was always a bit hard to know what to look at first, like where are the most pressing problems. And the first realization was that a test always passing is not an attainable or even a good goal even if you ignore flaky infrastructure for a while. And this, the reason is test complexity. The numbers here give you some idea about how many moving parts are involved for testing a cockpit PR. And you have to add to that the unreliable timing due to noisy cloud neighbors or cloud nodes doing something unexpected or erroneous or the tested operating systems they just tend to do stuff in the background. Uh, but we have to differ between bugs in our own product and tests. They are under our own control, and these are the ones we need to fix. And then bugs in the operating system. These we need to investigate, report, and track, and then skip errors when they happen. And finally, the failures of infrastructure. Like for those, which tries are really justified and also unavoidable to some degree. So 
So we wanted to become more systematic and objective about all this to, in order to get us out of this hole. So we wanted to define goal, what keeps us happy and productive, and then define a budget for how much failure we are ready to tolerate. And then we translated those into service level indicators and objectives, which then drill down into the specifics. Then, of course, you need to implement the measurement and the evaluation of these indicators. And most importantly, we need to define a strategy how we deal with test failures in a sensible way, that they don't treat all the failures in the same way. So we've met with our team to discuss what keeps our velocity and motivation. And pretty much everyone agreed that these are three main things. Pull requests need to get test results reliably, and they need to get validated in a reasonable time. And failures in these tests need to be relevant and meaningful. Humans must not waste time on interpreting unstable test results to figure out if they are unrelated or relevant to the change that they are proposing. And we must not be afraid of touching code. So we've written down these goals on our public wiki page. The link is here on the slide. So this gives us some commitment to them. And after that, we formulated service level objectives to define what we exactly mean with these goals. So on the same wiki page, we have six service level objectives and they define the measurable properties together with an objective that implement aspects of our goals. So the first example here uh, uh, describes test reliability, so that we don't want to retry pull requests too often unnecessar unnecessarily. And the second one applies to infrastructure reliability. We have four more, as I said, but uh, they are just different aspects and they don't really introduce anything fundamentally new. Fortunately, almost all of the required data can be derived from the GitHub Statuses API. So this is a machine readable API that gives you the whole history of what happened to all the tests in the pull request. You can see the initial status here when a PR just gets submitted. So nothing much happened yet. We just know that we have a pending test request and we know when it happened in the created at timestamp. And once a bot picks up the pending test request, it will change the description to in progress and attach a target URL so that you can follow the logs. And it will also create a, a new created at timestamp. And the time delta between this created at timestamp and the previous status with number zero, that gives you the time that it's spent in the queue. So this is exactly for comp computing the first SLI that I mentioned. And once the test finishes, uh, the state will change to success or failure. So here in this case, it's a failure. And as I mentioned, the status API remembers the entire history. So if we can read the history there, when we see that a failure goes back to in progress and eventually success, we can deduce that this was a retry and tally it accordingly. For that, we have a store test script, which reads and interprets this history for merged PR and puts it into a SQLite database. So the link is on the slide. And we also regularly do SQL queries on that database to calculate the current values of the indicators and export them in Prometheus text format. And then we have a Prometheus instance to regularly read and pick up the current values and store it into its brain so that we have a whole history of these indicators. And then we have an accompanying Grafana instance, which graphs these SLIs and the objectives in a nice way. So we can move around in time and investigate problem spots more closely. Again, the link to Grafana is on the slide, it's public. And you don't need to be concerned about the details here, it's just to give you a coarse impression. But one important detail are the red bars. 
they show the service level objective. That means where the indicator exceeds the expectation and it starts to eat into our error budget. So this is interesting real-time data, but it's not a sufficient view for how much of our error budget we used up in the last month. And for that, we have another set of graphs which shows the error budget usage of the last 30 days. Again, link is on the slide. So for example, this is the budget of our first objective about merging a PR without or with retries. So this doesn't mean that 80% of pull requests uh, were retried. It means that our error budget of retries needs uh, was 25%. So 75% of pull requests get merged without retries, 25 are allowed with retries. And of these 25%, we used up about 80% of that margin. So we are still good as per our own goal, but judging the slope here, we will most likely exhaust the budget in the next days. So we will probably need to take action soon. And this is the budget for the other mentioned SLO about the queue time. So most of the time, this is really fine but it completely exploded when the Westford data center went down. So that data center hosts our main workload and it's the only place which can run Red Hat internal tests. There is no permanent fallback for those. Normally when this happens, we just spin up a fallback in AC2. But as you can see from the dates here, this happened right at the start of the end of year holidays. And since nobody in our team was around to do work, nobody cared much. And the pending pull requests were just automated housekeeping pull requests which were found by the bots and they were neither that interesting nor urgent. So finally, I want to drill down a little bit into how we handled individual tests. Uh, the high level goals of don't we try PRs too often and so on. These are really emergent results of the hundreds of individual test outcomes that come from each pull request. And as I explained before, we can't expect 100% success rate due to this random noise mostly. So we introduced the concept of an affected test. That means if a pull request changes the code which a test covers or it changes the test itself, we call that test affected. And we introduced an automatic retry of unaffected tests so that uh, they get retried up to th two times and it just has to succeed one out of these three. That is the carrot in that equation and it made our lives dramatically better because that's essentially the bit that takes care about all these weird random failures that are just noise. However, this is not sufficient because with just this approach, you would quickly introduce new flaky tests and overall your quality would quickly go down. Soon enough, uh, the test would be so bad that not even three retries would be enough. So we need to introduce the counterweight, the stick. And that is that affected tests need to pass three times in a row. And that has shown us to be very effective in preventing the introduction of broken tests. And thirdly, we also need to track tests which fail too often. Of course, there's always some base failure rate of a few percent due to the noise, but that random noise should distribute evenly across the tests. The ones which are interesting are the ones which fail more than 10% of the times, because they are the ones that are breaking pull requests even with automatic retry and they fail a little too often to explain them away with just random noise. So these are the ones that we need to investigate and fix. And also at any given time, this list is very small. So we can drive it to zero and we know exactly where we get the most bang for the buck. So where are we now? I'm pretty happy with this overall, I must say. In the last poll in our team, everyone said that they are not feeling blocked by or scared of pull requests and tests anymore. And 
productivity and turnaround is really good right now. The main missing thing is that we need to add the notification or escalation from Grafana once our budgets are decreasing and too close to the limit or even above it. So right now it's just me looking at these graphs every now and then. And another important point is that we need to regularly review and adjust these objectives to our current feeling of happiness. The goals might need to get tighter, for example, if we figure out that we are still not happy about the number of retries that we have to do. Or possibly we also need to relax them. We had a case where an objective was too strict. We violated it all the time, but in, in reality, nobody cared or even noticed that something was wrong. And it doesn't make sense to spend time on fixing the thing for an artificial goal that nobody cares about. You adjusted, adjusted the goal instead. And finally, we also need a more formal process of going into the hour budget fixing mode once. So that means to announce it to other teams and having a better mindset about it. Right now it's still a bit too much ad hoc. And then of course, there's a lot of other things which we could do. For example, we might want to set up an automatic fallback uh, if our main data center fails, as it did over the holidays. So normally this is just a single Ansible playbook and the fallback is expensive in dollar terms. So it is not automatic and a given that we, we have to do this. This is a conscious decision which we need to take, like how much do we want to value uh, some human control against ruining our statistics. But at the end of the day, the statistics are just a tool. Uh, we don't, uh, we, we still can do decisions given on that. So if you have uh, deeper questions, uh, we welcome you to join our chat and talk to us in hash cockpit on RSC. And here's also a link to our homepage, uh, which has pointers to the mailing list and documentation and uh, knowledge about how mobile bots works. Thanks a lot for, our, for your attention. We still have some minutes for Q&A now.